Fencing of recreational area irritates residents in NCD. PNG Power sign MOA with Eastern Highlands communities. And Western Highlands reports four COVID-19 cases. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for National MTV News. Three more positive COVID-19 cases were reported in Western Highlands province, bringing the total number of confirmed cases to four. All four from the same family of a nursing officer at Mount Hagen General Hospital. Provincial COVID-19 Committee is urging Western Highlanders and visitors to maintain social distancing and wear masks at all times. The four COVID-19 confirmed cases are from a family of a nursing officer who resides at the Mount Hagen General Hospital premises. The positive cases were revealed last week using the gene expert machine at the hospital, which had also saved time and cost to get the results back. Further contact tracing suggested that the source was from a local pastor in Pabrabuk at the border of Western Highlands and Southern Highlands. The pastor is related to the nursing officer who recently came in contact with the nursing sister at her workplace. A team was sent today to locate the pastor to get him tested. If the results come back positive, the whole community will be tested. The family is in lockdown while the health promotion team are doing contact tracing and swab testing. So far, results of the school where the first COVID-19 patient is attending came back negative. The provincial COVID-19 committee is urging people to maintain social distancing and hygiene, flex elbows when coughing, and stop large gatherings. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Up until recently, the country's total number of COVID-19 cases reached 646, including seven deaths. To date, 32,221 people have been tested for coronavirus. 597 people have recovered, whilst there are 42 active cases in isolation. Communities in the Arona Valley in the Yonki Dam area of Eastern Highlands will now engage effectively to draw down outstanding development assistance funds. This follows constant dialogue in the past weeks between Arona Valley Development Authority and PNG Power Limited. A memorandum of agreement was signed between concerned stakeholders to pave way for closer and collaborative efforts of stakeholders. Following days of discussions, the PPL and the Arona Valley Development Authority will work towards better understanding of its establishment and purpose to serve communities in the Yonki Dam area. The MOA is the eighth since the establishment of the authority. Funding by PNG Power will now be utilized. It will enable us, Arona Valley Development Authority, to draw down funds from our 2014 to 2018 development assistance package. A total of 35 million kina has been spread over the 30-year period, but to some extent the locals face difficulties. For PNG Power, it's a new beginning to realize the purpose of a two-way business dialogue. PPL has assured its commitment. Both the PNG Power team and AVDA have come around the table and we now understand what the original intent of this mission, this vision was. The chairman of the Arona Valley Development Authority says while a key dilemma has been addressed by the new MOA, more work needs to be done to address other issues. All these will be focused leading on from the signed MOA. One demand has been uh, addressed through Penji Power, that is uh, MOA, and uh, I'm happy with that. And uh, we are looking forward to working with Penji Power to further address other issues that we have stated in our petition previously. Mr. Chairman, Mr. GM, uh, you have the full support of PNG Power, you have the full support of the PNG Power Board, and we see this as a fresh start and a new beginning for the communities in and around Yonki. The MOA is for a period of three years. 
Jack LaPava, Jr., National M TV News. In efforts to provide clean drinking water for its surrounding communities, New Power Limited continues its donation of water storage tanks to villages in the Hiri West. Bora Village today saw the handover of their water tanks by New Power representatives. The need for access to clean and safe drinking water is a concern for villages located around the PNG LNG plant sites in the central province. And companies like New Power Limited, who are located within the vicinity of these communities, have put community assistance programs in place to alleviate the water problem, as well as other much needed services and infrastructure. A short ceremony was held at Boira Village today to commemorate and acknowledge the handover of one of the tanks to Boira Primary School. In total, New Power Limited had donated three water tanks to Boira Village. One here at the primary school and two others are placed near the village pastor and village councillor's houses. The donation of water tanks is part of New Power's community engagement program and stems to promote and provide clean drinking water for impact areas of Hiri West. Today, we are here to hand over the, this dispersed uh, three tanks. And I'm glad to announce that uh, we are happy to donate the three by 9,000 litre tanks for Boira. And you, we, we supply those so that you can have clean drinking water. So far, New Power Limited has donated a total of nine 9,000 litre water storage tanks to Poribada, Papa and now Boira Village. Residents of Gerahu Stage 3B in the nation's capital rallied today to voice their anger and frustration at the National Capital District and a developer for fencing their recreational area for development. The community have a petition going and have called for an audience with NCD Governor Poes Pakop. The recreational area in question is Section 416, Lot 1, at Gerahu Stage 3B, a recreational area where the community spends time playing sports and enjoying the open space. But now it is under development and the community are not happy about it. This is the community. This is Gerahu Stage 3B. And in this community, the government was gracious enough to give us a reserve, this recreational area. It was a shock to the community that the public area was being fenced. This has brought on frustration to what they describe as an act of greed. So suddenly this morning I wake up and I see a post on Facebook from, like, from Guildford that someone's putting a fence around here and he's got three patrol car, police cars here with guns and they're putting up a fence and they're trying to work overtime. They've been working overnight and they're trying to put up a fence in, I don't know, two days or... Very funny. Now, the guy, what's going on? Is NCDC trying to build a, a nice facility for us? That's why they're putting up a fence to try to banish him. But this doesn't look like a temporary fence. This is a permanent fence. Look at the structure on the other side. Then you look at the like him. This is a permanent fence that's going around here. Whoever that's taken over this place is trying, he's trying to build a facility that will benefit himself. Long-time resident James Melegepa says that it is under suspicious circumstances that this has happened with no consultation with the community, something he says is a must. The most important thing, the most minimum thing that's supposed to be done is for a consultation of the community who lives around here yes. before you do any subdivisions. Yes. Yes. That has not taken place. Yes. <laughs> so we demand for Poe Spakov to come down and tell us exactly what has happened. Yes. So you will walk in this flop and stand, you will like give him number to come no sir. We are very suspicious of how the title has been issued. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it has to be reversed immediately. There is another twist with NCDC losing a court case to withdraw the land from the developer. This has led to the developer taking the court order with police presence to stop the community from disputing their rights to the recreational area. Another long-time resident, Richard Wagambi, made some digging on the matter and says they will have a lawyer look into the case on their behalf. Whoever it is has gone to court and has won his case against NCDC. NCDC has applied to withdraw this from the perpetrated owner. But he has gone to court and he's got a court, court order, uh, which I think the policemen have brought here today. I went to the Metropolitan Command this morning to obtain a copy 
But unfortunately, all the officers were out of the office, so I couldn't get a copy. But I, I believe the policemen are here to, to show us that copy, and we will act upon that and get a, a, a lawyer to represent us to make sure that we take this facility back from whoever that is that has won this. The community are resilient and are calling on NCD Governor Poe Spakop to present himself with answers to their queries. They also want the governor to receive a petition with a strong 2,000 signatures from the community. So this is like, yeah, asking, for us, you now, you must come up here now, not talk, kill you, me, blah, blah, listen, blah, why you like selling to the ground of this man? Our honorable governor, our good governor, we appeal to you, the community in 3B, for you to physically come here because where we are standing now, this is where we cast our ballot vote. So if the governor is out there, please, uh, uh, you come to your people and um, see us because this field has been part of part and parcel of the community uh, and it is a uh, important integral part of the community so uh, we will be having 2,000 signatories on this petition and we want the governor to come and take it from us. Fidelis Sukina, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We'll have more of the day's stories after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. A tussle between two biological brothers over a property worth 5 million kina has taken another twist. Younger sibling Joshua Nick has brought the matter to the National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate after the case against his brother Sak Ben Wea was dismissed by the National Court. This land opposite R.H. Hypermart at Gordon's in Port Mosby is the area now in dispute. It was a land formerly owned by two blood brothers, Joshua and Suck, before both parties disagreed on the sale of the property in 2015. That dragged on until a conclusion that saw the courts favoring elder brother, Suck Ben Weir. That, however, has taken a different turn now with younger sibling Joshua, who has sought criminal charges against him. I maintain that the issue is raised, uh, were raised at the National Court, and a competent National Court competently dealt with each one of them and came with the decision. The dates for the case to be brought to the courts, according to Sark, have not yet been set. He has been charged for three counts of forgery, one count of uttering, and one count of false and fraudulent representation. As a brother, Sack feels it's gone too far. Because I'm the first in the family. I provide everything for all these people. This Joshua Nick, he doesn't own anything in Mosby. He stays in my house there at... Uh, Wildlife is a high covenant house, three bedroom. The disagreement between the two brothers has even brought other family members into the picture. They don't want this to continue. I went back and forth to Nick Joshua's place as one of the village elders in living in Port Mosby to have it solved outside of court. I've had court, many courts already. And uh, can we have this matters? discuss outside as families. Sark is now out on 2,000 kina police bail. The property now disputed is worth 5 million kina and is located in one of the prime locations in the city. Bradley Valenaki, National MTV News. Telecom PNG has reduced its domestic call rates on fixed line by 50% to allow greater use of fixed voice services. Fixed line customers nationwide will now save more on voice calls. Telecom PNG deploys fixed line telephone services throughout Papua New Guinea via its extensive network infrastructure built around the country. This service provides both post paid and prepaid telephone services. Uh, telecom is more on a fixed business, so we're looking at the way forward how we should move uh, in, a, in that uh, business. So um, today, uh, this time, we want to announce that we've actually taken a step forward on a fixed business. 
and that uh, we looked at fixed line domestic call rates and the charges. So um, we want to announce that we've taken a, a price reduction on the uh, fixed line rates. Fixed line local calls within the same area code used to be one toy per minute. Now for just 30 toy per call, you can talk for free. Calls to another area code such as to other parts of the country are no longer 50 toy per minute but 25 toy during peak and off peak hours. Calls to B-Mobile numbers are now 40 toy per minute during peak hours and 20 toy per minute during off peak hours. The flag fall charge is also reduced to 30 toy per call to all fixed line and B-Mobile numbers. Uh, price reduction on the fixed line. All those customers that are our value customers who have been uh, with us uh, day one ever since this fixed business been there. Uh, now we've actually given them benefit of price reduction. Fixed line calls to Digicel and the flag fall rates remains the same. These new rates are effective as of December 1, 2020 and apply to prepaid and postpaid fixed line voice services. Yana Zoriri, National MTV News. And now looking at the Nasfund market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0 0.2850 US dollars in the interbank markets. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0.2775 US dollars, 0.3718 Australian dollars, 0.2216 Euro and 28.28 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading lower. Coffee, cocoa and copra closed lower. Crude oil is trading lower, palm oil closed lower and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 185.28 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 1.66 points higher and the All Ordinaries is trading at 0.88 points lower. National MTV News continues with more after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Given the limited manpower capacity and funding availability for the police force in Papua New Guinea, the process of police investigation and prosecution can be a tedious experience. Beno Buwingu is the complainant in a willful murder case in West New Britain province. It is eight years now since the murder of three youths allegedly by police and CIS officers took place in Kimbe, and Mr. Buwingu filed a complaint in 2012, but says they there still has been no proper investigation and arrests made by police as yet. After a number of attempts to follow up on his complaint at the West New Britain Provincial Police Headquarters, Beno Buwingu found out that very little action was taken on the case by police. And so he eventually made his way to Port Moresby to follow up on the case visiting the Internal Investigation Unit at the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary Headquarters at Konedobu. As a former police officer himself, Buwingu hopes that the police force in PNG would be adequately funded to deal with such cases more quickly and for thorough investigations to be done. There was no investigation conducted by police officers, I mean Kimber Police. I led a complaint, but no action was taken. And uh, I've been going around Kokopo Police, uh, Regional Police Headquarters. No action taken. I, I came down to uh, Mosby, see the Police uh, Internal Investigation Unit in, in, here in NCD. That didn't eventuate as well. Nothing came. All they were telling me was, they've been telling me was that I have to wait. They will send officers across. One of the three youths who were murdered in Kimbe in 2012 was Mr. Buwingu's nephew, Gerard Kausam. Gerard Kausam was aged 19 and was a student of Biala High School when the murder incident took place. Speaking to MTV News, Buwingu claims that the three youths were innocent. So I rang the director, Internal Investigation Unit in Mosby. And what he told me was, uh, 
It's a very complicated case. It's nothing was complicated. Only the policemen to go and effect arrest and all this. They have to be charged. And they have been giving excuses that there is no money. Police department doesn't have money. Upon following upon his complaint, Mr. Buwingu has been told a number of times by police that due to funding constraints, police investigators could not be sent to West New Britain province to do thorough investigations. When contacted earlier this week via telephone, the provincial police commander for West New Britain province is aware of the case. However, the PPC says the complainant Mr. Buwingu should deal with the matter in the courts rather than go into the media. Attempts to get further information on the case at the police headquarters in Port Moresby have been unsuccessful. Dennis Orere, National MTV News. And turning overseas, drug and gun traffickers are the chief suspects in a robbery that reads like the plot from Netflix series Money Heist. Dozens of heavily armed, well-trained gunmen stormed the city in southern Brazil to burst into a bank. Gunfire shaking the sleepy Brazilian town awake. Hooded gunmen cloaked in body armor, holding the city of Ketesuma hostage. It was just before midnight when a convoy of 10 vehicles carrying at least 30 gunmen hit the city, making a beeline for Banco do Brasil. Over nearly two hours, the apparently well-trained gang detonating explosives and shooting weapons powerful enough to take down helicopters as they forced their way inside, deploying road spikes, burning cars, even lining hostages on the street as human shields to help hold off police. About 2.4 billion euros. You'd be forgiven for mistaking this for a plotline straight out of Spanish Netflix drama Money Heist. As events unfolded, the city's mayor urged locals to stay inside. I have no idea where they're from, but they're professionals. Never in the history of this city have we experienced something like this. While the villains in heist films usually make off with millions, these guys may not have been so lucky, leaving piles of cash behind. In fact, the only arrests so far people picking up notes on the road and in the gang's high-end vehicles dumped in a cornfield, bloodstains, evidence some had been shot. A security guard and military police officer were also injured in the firefight, the bank refusing to reveal how much cash was stolen. England's waking up to a new COVID dawn at the end of a month-long national lockdown, but the day brings yet another rollout of new rules and restrictions. It comes as COVID kills another 600 Britons, the toll rising to nearly 60,000. Reopening for Christmas, but you won't hear much cheer. It, it's, it's painful and it's been hugely frustrating for everybody in Lancaster. The city has one of the lowest COVID infection rates in the country, but it's an area where the disease has recently ramped up. So under the latest instalment of the tier system, it gets the toughest clampdown. It just seems unnecessary. It's, it's economic harm for, for the sake of it. Earlier in London, Boris Johnson headed to the Commons to try to persuade his MPs to back the new rules. For now, yes, but it wasn't pretty. This is not a return to normality. I wish it was so. But it is a bit closer to normality than the present restrictions. He won the vote, but lost the support of many of his backbenchers. But England's new normal is getting used to an ever-changing rulebook. Most of England will be in the two toughest levels of measures. That'll mean 55 million people remain banned from mixing with other households indoors. Gyms and beauty services like hairdressers will be open across all tiers, while pubs in Tier 2 can only open to serve substantial meals. Pubs in Tier 3 can only operate as a delivery or takeaway service. But there will be a Christmas reprieve, a five-day break which will allow up to three households to congregate for the festive period. And that will apply to all four nations in the UK. We do not consent! We do not consent! Last weekend, hundreds clashed with police in central London. People here are simply fed up after months of restrictions. I don't want to be vaccinated! I want to be free! I want to live my life! 
lives. I want all my friends to live their lives. Lives that continue to be profoundly shaped by the pandemic. The lives of many who don't quite know what to expect in the days ahead. And back home now, Morata Technical and Vocational Center has received support from the European Union to help improve the quality of TVET education. Morata Technical and Vocational Center is among 10 TVET institutions in the country receiving support from the European Union. Their facilities were opened today. The school facilities open today include double classrooms, workshops and water tanks, computer sets including a standby generator. Apart from the school facilities, the school also receives tools and equipment which will be fitted into the workshop buildings. The facilities valued at over 4 million kina were opened by representatives from the European Union, Department of Education and the National Planning Department. But thank God for the Tibet schools, we mold and shape our young boys and girls, and they're tapping into industries. They started doing the small business. They can able to sustain their own livings. Funded under the 10th EDF Human Resource Development Program Phase 2, the program was implemented by the Education Department for a period of four years ending in March this year. However, the infrastructure component was further extended to August to ensure proper completion of the facilities. The program aims to strengthen the vocational stream of education to develop skilled labor force, which is industry and market driven. The Morata Tivet Center is among 10 other institutions in the country who have received similar support. Over the past 10 years, in close cooperation with the Department of Education, the European Union has been actively supporting education, including technical and vocational education in PNG, with a total grant funding of approximately 160 million kina. We have got the medium-term plan, the long-term vision 2050, that talks about how we will uh, progress our development in initiatives. And our partners basically come to support the efforts of government in the areas they think that they can, uh, they can uh, support. The project also aims to achieve three key result areas, and that is to improve access to TVET institutions, improve quality of education, and improve governance of TVET system at the national and provincial level. The Education Department's TVET division was thankful for the support from the European Union. Uh, ministry or Department of has been taking a big lead, long facilitating Molsaka and helping Come long all Narbla countries long Papua New Guinea. Me pla, I'm almost now continue long look forward long work on the new plan long this kind of similar projects too as well. With the facilities now opened, Morata Vocational and Technical Centre will start enrolling more students starting next year. The people of Morata were also urged to look after the facilities. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. And your sport is next. Fidelis Sukina has the details. Thank you, Helen. Coming up in Trukai Sports, Rugby Union and Surfing. Join me after the break. Trukai Sports. And good night and welcome to Trukai Sports. To Rugby Union first, Paul Joseph, former PNG Pukpuks player, says there is still more that needs to be done to improve the level of Rugby Union, especially in the sevens format of the sport. There was a lot of excitement with teams from outside provinces making their presence felt at the recent Sports Talk Sevens tournament. While teams from Port Mosby and Ley look to dominate the tournament, there is still a lot of improvement needed by teams from outside provinces. PNG Pukpuks and Sevens legend Paul Joseph says this is something that needs urgent attention. Yes, it's good to have uh, players coming from outside, but they like that, you know, uh, the simple uh, skills of uh, knowledge of the game as well. And if we can, you know, go out to all the provinces, run the programs that is required at an early age, we can see, you know, uh, the stars are out there. Definitely the stars are not only in Mosby and Ley, but right around the country. He added that it has been tough times for rugby union in the country in recent years and he hopes for better times ahead for the sport so that programs to develop rugby union at the junior and grassroots level can continue. It's uh, disappointing 
and sad to see that you know we we still haven't got our house in order yet. And uh, I, you know, we are just hopeful and prayerful that you know all this uh, at the top can be resolved and the programs can go out to everyone right around the country to go out and then have uh, enjoy that uh, benefit of uh, learning the game at early age because we're still lacking that. Surfing Association Papua New Guinea, with support from the International Surfing Association Canada, is staging a virtual online surf judging course. This is part of preparations leading to the Second World Longboard Championships, set for February to March 2022 here in Papua New Guinea. The International Surfing Association has selected three female members of Papua New Guinea Surfing Association from its 11 affiliated surf clubs to sit the online surf judging course. Ms. Sylvia Pasco, Secretary of SAPNG representing Pyramid Board Riders in Port Moresby, Ms. Zanales Clark representing Central New Island Surf Club from New Island Province, and Ms. Florence Saki representing Shalom Surf Club from Vanimo, West Sipic Province. The online virtual ISA Level 1 Surf Judging course started today, Wednesday 2nd, and will end on Friday, 4th of December 2020. The course facilitators are ISA professional surfer and coach Eric Kramer and female surfer, former world longboard champion Tori Gilkison. SAPNG Contest Director Jason Pini said in a statement, the virtual course is a great platform, especially for women in the code, as it empowers women from all over the world to have the opportunity to sit at the judging table and participate at the highest level of surfing competition. He added that helping female members progress into all aspects of the sport of surfing has been a fundamental policy of SAPNG for many years. SAPNG president and co-founder Andrew Abel is confident that the three females chosen to sit the ISA surf judging course, along with many other aspiring surfers from around the world, will benefit from this opportunity that will enable them to judge surfing competitions at local, national and international levels. The three will also be shadow judges at the planned 2022 PNG Kumul World Longboard Championship, which will be beamed live stream to the world. As the SA PNG marks 31 years since the foundation with the establishment of surf clubs located around Papua New Guinea and more recently in central Bougainville, President and co-founder Andrew Abel believes this is the beginning of greater participation of women in the sport of surfing in line with its SAPNG Pink Nose Revolution Empowerment Policy in addressing women in surfing with equal rights and opportunities and gender-based violence. Kilawani, Trukai Sports. And Trukai Sports continues with sporting news abroad. Stay with us. True Kai Sports. And welcome back to True Kai Sports. To cricket abroad, Kane Williamson is back in white. The Black Cap skipper is gearing up for his return to international cricket in the first test against West Indies in Hamilton. It's been nine months since Kane Williamson last wore the silver fern. Mate, quite weird. I didn't, yeah, keep track of the months, but. Yeah, it's, um, it's great to get back with, with all the guys. The New Zealand captain sat out the 2020 series win over the West Indies, but returns for the two tests. While he's had a decent break in terms of the calendar year, he may sit out some more matches again this summer. Yeah, it's always a tough one. You want to be playing, you know, and, um, and the balance is, a, is often a managed thing. Um, you know, as a player, you're always looking at sort of the, the here and now and um, don't always look at the, the wider um, game, I suppose. But for now, the focus is this test and leading a side that features a debut for a man considered the most unlucky to have never played for them yet. Central batsman Will Young today confirmed to open the batting. Having had previous debuts curtailed by injury and the Christchurch terror attack. We've had a, a couple of chats and he's such a great fella and been, like you say, in and around the environment for some time without 
getting his, his first opportunity. So uh, I think that's also a real positive to have. But he might be hoping he doesn't have to bat first on this. Yes, the pitch is there. The message, though, don't be alarmed. I traditionally, particularly in visiting teams, see the amount of grass that we have. And but this is this is normal here for New Zealand conditions. And again, as on the Patamahoe clay, we, we need that grass to give us some, some, some pace. A fiery start on the agenda as New Zealand cricket's favourite son returns. And to basketball, Stephen Adams has turned the full force of his charm on the New Orleans media on day one with his new NBA side. The Kiwi proving again he's at least as entertaining off-court as he is on it, as he spoke for the first time since being traded from his team of seven years. A snapshot of the new Stephen Adams era. But while the kids knew, the man himself remains unchanged. Man, I'm corny, eh? <laughs> as self-deprecating as ever when discussing the team-first approach he's bringing to New Orleans. Just help them in whatever way I can. For all players. All equal. In other words, whatever he does is... For the greater good of the team. It's an unselfish style Oklahoma City will miss, but Adams says he bears no ill will after being traded from the only NBA side he's ever known, and where he became a firm favourite with fans and teammates alike. It's not like I died or anything, you know. Like, I'm going I'm to see them again. So, I mean, that's fine. Um, it, ain't, it ain't that sad. In the meantime, the Pelicans will also benefit from his physicality. He just dropped Lillard. I mean, he dropped him. Particularly alongside young rising star Zion Williamson. He's built. I know, he's just built like a brick. Yeah, you know the rest. If you're not punking the New Orleans Pelicans um, ever with those two guys next to each other. The respect goes both ways. Adams crediting Stan Van Gundy for being part of the reason he's signed a $50 million extension already. I feel like I could learn, learn a lot from him. Um, yeah, hence the extensionis. Sounds like a Harry Potter spell, mate. Fitting, given the 27-year-old's already charming his new home. Not least by acknowledging his role is much larger than his rebound count. You're representing a city. Also, the city's like history as well. That's like the main thing. It means a lot to people. And so it shouldn't be taken too lightly. And with that, he bade the media goodbye as only he can. Nice meeting you all. Fairly well. Stay safe. Wear a mask. If they didn't already, the Pelicans now well aware there's a big Kiwi in town. And that story wraps up Trukai Sports. Helen will be back with the weather report for the next 24 hours. Bye for now. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Rain showers and thunderstorms, then a cloudy morning tomorrow in Port Moresby. Occasional rain showers in Daru. Thundery rain showers easing tonight, then a cloudy morning in Kerama. Occasional rain showers and thunderstorms tonight with a cloudy morning in Alatau and rain showers and thunder tonight with a cloudy morning in Popandita tomorrow. In the Mamasu region, occasional rain showers easing tonight then a fine cloudy morning in Lee. Becoming cloudy tonight with morning rain drizzles in Medang. Thundery rain showers easing tonight, then a cloudy morning in Wewak and rain showers with thunder easing tonight, then a fine cloudy morning in Fanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, a few showers tonight, then a fine partly cloudy morning in Lorengau, a few showers in Kaviang. Mostly fine, though partly cloudy tonight with morning rain showers and drizzles in Kokopo and Rabaul. Fine, although partly cloudy tonight, then morning rain showers in Kimbe and thundery rain showers tonight with a fine cloudy morning in Buka. And in the Highlands region, a thundery rain showers tonight, easing, then morning fog in Mount Hagen, 
Rain drizzles tonight, then morning fog patches in Goroka and Kuntiawa. And rain showers and thunderstorms tonight with morning fog in Mendi and Wapek. Forecasts for small crafts for the next 24 hours. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait to Daru to Kiwai Islands to Kerama to Yule Island to Hood Point and to Samurai Island. Seas of 0 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of eastern and western Melon Bay Islands with waters of Samurai Island to East Cape to Cape Vogel through Huen Gulf to Finchhafen with waters of Finchhafen through Vitiaz and Dampier Straits to Siasi and Long Islands with waters of Long Island to Karkar Island to Wiwak to Aitape and to the northern PNG Indonesian border including waters of Manus and its western group of islands with waters of New Ireland to Bougainville and waters of east and west New Britain seas of 0.5 to 1.3 meters. A look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea. Seas slide to moderate with northeast to southeast winds at 15 to 20 knots in the Solomon Sea. Seas slide with east to southeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots in the Bismarck Sea. Seas slide with east to southeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots and in the Pacific Ocean. Seas slide to moderate with the northeast to southeasterly winds at 10 to 20 knots. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. And that's the way it is this Wednesday, the 2nd of December 2020. From the entire news team here, pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>